Um, I'm very excited to introduce tonight's presenter, uh, Rabbi David Seidenberg, is the creator of neohasid.org and author of Kabbalah and Ecology, God's Image in the More Than Human World. He has smicha from JTS and Reb Zalman and is an avid dancer, a new composer, and a lover of Jewish thought. So thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I'll turn things over to David. Thank you so much, Brian. I am putting a link in the chat that will be to all the texts that we're gonna to do tonight in several formats. So you have it there. That's on my website, neochasid.org. <clears throat> and let's see. So it looks like I'm looking at almost everyone, just their names or their pictures. People are not using their videos, which is okay. But if you want me to get a sense of, of uh, where you're at and what you're responding to, then turn on your video, because that does help me. So I'm going to share my screen now. And how's that looking to people? Everyone seeing what I'm what I'm what I'm putting up there? Let's see if we can get some chat feedback on this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to look at <coughs> the evolution of the of the kind of gestalt of what Torah is all about, and how Shemitah, the Jubilee year, responds to that, and how that creates a picture of the whole. Uh, ecology of the world that the Torah is engaged with. So <clears throat> what I want to say, first of all, is that in the Torah, the land is a character. Uh, the land is a person. The land has rights. The land has interests and desires. And that's not always something that's familiar or obvious to us. And it's also something that sometimes gets uh, lost in translation. In fact, there's quite a bit that gets lost in translation, as you'll see as we go through some of these texts. Um, the Torah, one of the, one of the goals of, of this study for me is, is to try to get underneath our assumptions about what the Torah means, to get into kind of a, see if we can get our minds connecting with the minds of the people who, who passed on these, these texts and these stories, which means getting out of our modern minds, having a different way of seeing the world. <coughs> so, just to give one example, <clears throat> pardon me. I just got over pneumonia, so I might be coughing a bit. I hope no one minds that too much. To give one example that is very much connected to ecological issues, but not in the most obvious way. In the Torah, uh, well, separate from the Torah, we understand that there's a soul and a body. That's how most people think about the world. There's a soul and there a body, and they come together. That's a human being. And there's a lot of assumptions made in there about the idea that there is a metaphysical dimension of the human person that is that is somehow on a different plane than in the physical dimension. And if you look at the Torah, <clears throat> the words we use to translate soul are neshama, nefesh, ruach. These are all words that, that end up being connected to soul and spirit. Not one of them uh, is only a metaphysical word. In fact, there is no such thing as a metaphysical word in the Torah. So um, neshama means breathing. Even though we use it to mean soul, it means breathing. And nefesh, in many places in the Torah, actually means corpse, a dead body. Nefesh adam asher yumat. So there's a very clear difference in the way that worldview worked than the way we think of things. Because we like to use nefesh to mean soul. And, and of course, Kabbalah uses it to mean one of the levels of the five levels of soul. Um, but, but in the Torah, nefesh really means animate body, body animated by divine power, essentially. <clears throat> so when we can get over those dichotomies between metaphysical and physical, then so suddenly we might start seeing things in the Torah that we might not have seen otherwise. Just, that's just one example. <clears throat> so here we're going to go through a bunch of texts. I want to show you how Genesis, Bereshit, is the story of a, <clears throat> a 
of two relationships or three relationships actually. One is between God and humanity. The second is between the land and humanity or the earth and humanity. Of course, in Torah, there's no distinct uh, difference. There's no vocabulary difference between the word land and the word earth. They're used the same way, both as arets. Um, so the second is between land or earth and humanity. And the third is between the other animals and humanity. Those are the three relationships that are constantly undergoing metamorphosis through the stories of Bereshit, all the way up to Abraham, Avraham, or Avram, actually. And what, what one sees if one traces the thread of these relationships is that, in fact, uh, the, most of Genesis leading up to the part that's particular to us, the Jewish part, so to speak, is about how these relationships fail, how humanity continuously does things to destroy and degenerate and denig um, um, denigrate their relationship with, with God, with the land, and with the other animals. So here we go. Now we're going to go into this. <clears throat> it might help me, by the way, at some point, if someone else can do reading of the text, given that I'm still getting over this pneumonia. So that if I you, so if somebody would like to do a reading of a text, uh, please press the raise your hand using the raise hand button, and then I will um, unmute you. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Do we have anyone? I'm going to go for the first one, and hopefully, as we go forward, we'll get some other people who want to help read. <coughs> so, the Elo and Elohim created the Adam in God's image. Male and female, the one created them. And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said to them, Bear fruit and increase, and fill the land and occupy her. Milua to arts for keep shuha, and prevail over every animal crawling on the land. Here we have an issue, an, uh, uh, an image of hierarchy between humans and the other animals. It's very clearly defined. What it means is not clearly defined, however. What does it mean for the humans to have dominion or to prevail over or to dominate? The Torah doesn't give us any clue in this first chapter of Bereshit what that actually means. We do know something that it doesn't mean from the next line. And Elohim said, here, I've given to you all every plant seeding seed, which is on the face of all the land. And every tree which has in him tree fruit seeding seed, for he will be for he for you, meaning for you all, you human beings, he will be for eating, meaning the tree, and for every animal of the land, chayat hasader, in which chayat haaretz, in which there is a living soul, a nefesh chaya, every green plant for eating. So the first image was one of hierarchy, but then the second image of the relationship between humans and animals, we're eating the same food. And one thing most important, we're not eating the other animals. Yeah. So whatever dominion or prevailing over means, it doesn't mean that you can take the life of an animal, at least on the shot level of this first chapter. It doesn't mean that you can eat another animal. <clears throat> and Elohim saw all the one, all the, the one had made. I use one and God's small g as a pronoun for God so that I'm not saying masculine pronouns for God but you understand what I mean. So the literal would be, and Elohim saw all that he made, but I'm changing this here. And Elohim saw all that the one made, and here, very good, it's very good. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and made him holy, for in him, the one stopped from all God's work. This last image is one of a, kind of a radical equality because in here, even God is stepping back from being, from being uh, in a hierarchy over the rest of creation in a way, stepping back, not being the one who controls and changes and creates and forms, but simply receiving in a way. <clears throat> so the first chapter of Genesis has an inter interesting interplay between hierarchy and, and um, equality going on. You notice here though, with the land, we don't hear, we don't hear anything about what occupy and fill the land means either. We just hear the general command. In the second chapter, which is where we're about to get to, uh, we have a different picture of all these things. And it's going to add a lot to what we have to say about what the Torah means. 
for our ancestors and for us. So here we, in here we are in chapter two. Every growth of the field would yet be in the land and every plant of the field would yet grow. For Adonai Elohim had not caused rain on the land and Adam and an Adam to serve the ground was not. There was no Adam la avod et ha Adama. Adonai Elohim formed the human dirt from the ground or dirt from the earth or dirt from the soil, a farmina adama, and blew in his nostrils a living breath, nishmat chayim, and the adam became a living soul, a nefesh chaya. <coughs> so there's a lot in this passage, quite a, bot, quite a lot in this passage. So the purpose of the human here is to serve the ground. And the human is called human because human is from humus, right, as it were. Uh, that's, a, that's a midrash that I've heard from Arthur Wasco to talk about human and humus, but the word Adam comes from Adama. So in the first chapter of Bereshit, we don't get any hint about why we're called Adam. And yet, in, and then in the second chapter, it's the most important point that's made is that the human comes from the humus, the Adam comes from the Adama. Notice also, the human becomes a nefesh chaya in the second chapter. And in the first chapter, all the other animals are called nefesh chaya. If you look in many translations, you'll find that the first nefesh chaya is translated differently than the second one because they kind of want to cover over the fact that there's not a metaphysical distinction being made between humans and the other animals. That's one of those examples where, where uh, getting underneath the translation can become important for seeing new dimensions of what the Torah is teaching us. <coughs> Adonai Elohim planted a garden in Eden eastward and Adonai Elohim took the Adam and placed or rested him in Gan Eden to serve her and to watch over her. Okay. What does it mean to serve her? Usually in most translations, this will be translated as to work her which sounds like a version of what it means to dominate the land, to prevail over, to fill it and conquer it, whatever that means, <clears throat> to work the land. That's not what the Hebrew means. The Hebrew means to serve. La'avod can mean worship. It can mean give service to. But it's always a, a, an act of um, giving to this other, whatever, being, entity, dimension, that's greater than oneself. <clears throat> That's what it means. And if you think about it, the, the Lashan, the, 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 the language used here is quite exactly the same as the language used for God in the second paragraph of the Shema. Same exact grammatical form. or so one is masculine, one is feminine, but the exact same conjugation, exact same vowel pattern. So it's telling us that somehow, whatever this means, the human role is to serve the land. So in fact, it's the opposite, opposite, the opposite hierarchy from what we find in the first chapter. <coughs> and Hashem Elohim commanded over the Adam saying from every tree in the garden eating you will eat and from the tree of knowing good and bad you will not eat from him for in the day of your eating from him dying you will die what we see throughout all these texts and through the Shemitah text is that the question of eating is paramount and that it determines again and again or defines again and again what the relationships are what's going right in those relationships or wrong in those relationships and what the ideal is that we're supposed to be shooting for. <clears throat> I'm gonna go on from here um, to D and then I'm gonna see if anyone has questions or comments after we get through this next letter uh, paragraph. <clears throat> Adonai Elohim said, Lo tov, heyot adam levado, it's no good the human, the Adam being by himself. I will make for him a help opposite him. And Adonai Elohim formed every animal of the field, kochayat hasadeh, and every bird of the skies, and brought unto the Adam to see what he would call to him. 
And the Adam called names to every beast, Behema, and to every animal of the field, Kolchayat Asadeh. And for Adam, no help corresponding to him was found. And Adonai Elohim built the side which God took from the Adam into a woman. Notice it says the Adam, the Adam, and then it says Adam with a capital A. You see that? Because up until now, the word Adam has meant a species, not a person. And so it's always Ha-Adam, but then it shifts to Adam. And all of a sudden, there's a moment where it's being used as a name. Now, it's coming here because the question is, who's going to give Adam a name? Right? So Adam names all the other animals. According to a, a, a beautiful way of looking at this text from, from Ramban, <coughs> What's going on here, what it means for there to be no help corresponding to him is that Adam gives every animal a name. And after Adam gives the animal a name, Adam waits for the animal to give him a name. And this happens again and again, but nobody gives the Adam a name back. And that's the loneliness, is, is not being able to share this process of naming. So we get the name Adam as a name in this moment where Adam is not getting named, where there's a struggle or this, this existential anguish about being named in a way. And then of course the, the Adam, according to Midrash, is male and female separated in two halves, the male half and the female half. Uh, from this perspective, the male half gets to remember what happened before and the female half doesn't, which creates a gender hierarchy, which le leads to eating from the tree of knowing good and bad. Because if you remember the Midrash, um, the snake comes and pushes the, 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 uh, Eve into the tree, and she touches the tree. And the, the snake says, uh, are you not allowed to, to eat or touch from any, any tree in the garden? And, and Eve says, we're not allowed to touch the tree. And then she touches the tree, and she doesn't die. And according to the Midrash, Adam, being a, a, someone who thought he was smarter than he really was, decided he would give Eve a fence around the mitzvah. And so he said, you shouldn't eat it and you shouldn't touch it, which gave an opening for the snake, to, the nachash, to push Eve into the tree so that she would touch it and understand that the whole thing was a bunch of malarkey. And then, right, <clears throat> remember the snake, it says, was clever. He spoke to the woman and the woman saw that the tree was good to eat. And he was dire, desire for the eyes, and the tree was pleasurable for enlightening, nechmad lahaskil. And she took from his fruit and ate and gave to her man with her, and he ate. Okay, now I want to pause and see if anyone has questions. I meant to pause a little before, but let's pause here. See if anyone has questions or comments they want to make. Um, so a number of people um, <laughs> raised their hands. Uh, when you're asking for potential readers, and I'm wondering if oh, any that's of what those, that means. Good. That's what that. So, does any of those folks? Uh, some of you, I think, I unmuted. Um, any of you have any questions or comments? Um, yes, I actually raised my hand. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay? we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I, I have to sort of whisper because my downstairs neighbor is going to kill me if I wake her up. But anyways. Um, yes, I offered to read, but I also do have a comment that um, I believe you said there was three relationships, the one between God and Adam and the one between the land and Adam and the one between um, um, the animals. Mm -hmm. And how about, how about, isn't there, like, how about the human relationship? Wouldn't you mean that... between Adam and Chava at this point? Exactly. Like, I mean, yeah. there's, a, there's a whole, right? Or, Absolutely. Or we're, we're just not going there. <laughs> I don't mind going there. It's not the focus of this particular yeah. thread of text that I put together. But yes, of course, that's going on. Um, yes, it's, okay. not, it's not a thread that stays uh, present in all the stories as we go forward. So it's it, um, at least not in the obvious way that the others do. Okay. Just okay. Mm -hmm. But at this point, in fact, it's quite it is quite important because uh, there's a there's a subtle gender hierarchy because Adam remembers what happened before and Chava doesn't, and that hierarchy of knowledge of knowing creates 
the kind of disaster which leads to the curse of gender hierarchy, which is what we're about to read. Oh, interesting. That's really interesting because I actually also, uh, um, yeah, I'm a little <coughs> obsessed with Genesis myself and particularly um, that, I mean, in a way it's a blessing for Eve that she, um, her for, first experience is an experience of transformation. Like in my Midrash, she, Adam is created directly, I guess, from God, but she is created from another human being so that she is understands that things can change. She was once Adam and now she's Eve, right? So mm -hmm. she is more interested in transformation and change while Adam is more interested in um, uh, holding on to what was and sort of trying to keep everything the way it was maybe. Oh. And, it's, and it is lonely, but anyways. That's I think that's a beautiful way to look at it. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of richness in what you're suggesting, Marilyn. Very much so. But that's <laughs> not where we're going today, anyway. So, but I just, yeah. It will. It might come up again more. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Feel yeah. free to point out what you notice. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to make questions, or shall I call on someone um, to read, starting had, with F? I had a question about section D. Go ahead, Matt. Um, where you said that it goes from being uh, the Adam to a uh, proper noun name. Like, Indeed, right, yes. Um, um, is that indicated by like some grammar in the Hebrew? Like does it drop? Yeah, it, it says Ha-Adam and then it says Adam. Without okay. the Ha at the beginning. That makes sense. Yeah, and it, it happens again but, but interestingly, it goes back to the Adam right away, and it doesn't get back to calling Adam Adam like that until a little bit later. So it, it happens, and then it stops happening, and then it comes back. Interesting. <clears throat> and Matt, since, uh, you're, since you have your mic on, do you want to read next? Uh, sure, and j but just one more question along that point. Um, you said that with Ha Adam, it's referring to uh, mankind as a species rather than like a uh, an individual like person. Is that possibly is it, does that leave leave room open for there being more than just one person besides Adam at that point? That's an interesting question. You know, um, I would say that's not the shot, the simple meaning of the text. But there's quite a long tradition of people talking about pre-Adamite human beings is the expression. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know enough about that tradition of commentary and it's more in the Christian world than in the Jewish world, but it's definitely an important, important, important query that people make. <clears throat> you know, it, it's kind of an obvious question to ask because who do, you know, who do Cain and Abel or Cain and Shakes because of course Abel dies. Who do they marry? Yeah. So, the, so one one way of looking at it is well, there must have been some other kind of human being wandering around that got integrated into this particular human family. The Midrash's answer is that Cain and Abel each were born with a twin that they married, which is interesting and strange. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> but clearly, it's a lacuna in the text. It doesn't tell us. Where are the women coming from, right? All we know yeah. is Chava. So it's an open question and a good one. Okay. Thank you. Was that Matt just talking? Uh, yeah. So that was. That was okay. Me. So go start reading. Start reading through. Um, read up to. In uh, for you are dirt, and we'll turn back to dirt. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, st starting from F. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Adonai Elohim called unto the Adam and said to him, Where are you? Ayecha, who told you that you are naked? Arumin. Is it from the tree which I commanded you against eating you ate? 
Unto the woman, the one said, increasing, I will increase your labor pain. Each von nech. And to Adam, the one said, because you to your woman's voice and ate from the tree, cursed is the ground soil for your sake. Adurah Adama ha In pain, the itzavon, you will eat of her all the days of your life, and thorn and thistle will grow for you, and you will eat the grass the sev of the field until you return to the ground, because from her were you taken, for you are dirt and will turn back to dirt. Thank you. Uh, you must have noticed I apparently cut out by accident the word listen because you listened to your woman's voice is what it should have said in that paragraph. So, <coughs> okay, there's quite a bit going on here. Now, first of all, these things that we tend to think of as curses are descriptions of the state of the world as it should not be. So the gender hierarchy that's described here, which, which is, I, I've, I've skipped some of that. So the part of it goes, uh, and your desire will be toward your man, but he shall rule in you. Um, that part, that gender hierarchy is described as something that is not the way the world should be. Right? Uh, same thing with the, with the hierarchy, um, with, not with the hierarchy, but the, the curse that happens to the soil. But there's a, some subtle stuff going on here with the curse of the soil that's really important to notice. Aurora ha'adama ba'avorcha. Ba'avorcha can mean because of you, meaning because you did this, this is the consequence. But it can also mean for your sake or for your benefit. And what I want to uh, suggest to you, open your minds to, is the possibility that what this is saying here is the ground is cursed for your benefit, because if you're going to be cursed, I want to curse the ground too, so that you and the ground stay in close relationship. And that will seem like kind of a, a, an isogesis, a, a midrash on the text. But what you'll see when we go a little bit further is that it actually makes good sense of what happens next in the text. Even though here it just sounds like a midrash that I'm adding to the text. There's So, you know, human... Can you guys see my hands? I actually can't see my picture now. Um, anyway, so so we're we're at at this we're at this level, and God is here. You know, we're all kind of close together, right? And then the humans drop down. So now we're distant from God, and God says, "Okay, the ground is going to be cursed also, so that you're not also distant from the ground, so that you still have that connection at least." And that makes sense of the next line, especially. Adonai Elohim through him or them, because we're talking about Adam and Chava, right? Out of Gan Eden to serve the ground from where he had been taken. Adama Asher Lukach Misham. So I think the image most people have when they think of um, Adam and Eve leaving Gan Eden is that they wander into the desert in anguish. You know, there's that one um, Renaissance painting with, with Adam, like this hand over his head and, and the angel like casting them out and who knows where they're going to go. But that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says that these two human beings are taken and brought to a special place. It's not the Garden of Eden. It's a different, equally special place. It's the human birthplace. So... <clears throat> And again, it's to serve the ground. So it's usually translated as to work the ground, but it really means to serve, to be in service to the ground. It seems that the goal is for humanity to learn how to serve the ground properly. And there's something going on like God saying, it's not working in, garden, in the Garden of Eden. Let's try, if I put the human in the place that it was born from, surely in that place, they will understand the connection to the earth. Surely in that place, they will be able to live in the right way. Surely in that place, they'll be able to have the right relationship with the land. That's how I read this part of the text. <clears throat> and uh, the fact that people always overlook this line and don't notice that that's what's happening tells you something about the kind of blinders and assumptions that we bring to the text that make us not read what's there. So that's important to notice. <clears throat> 
All right, who wants to read the, the um, G part? The whole, Cain, the whole Cain and Abel story or the whole abridgment of the Cain and Abel story. I'll do it. Okay, go ahead. Cain rose from G, right? Yes. Cain rose up to Hevel, his brother, and killed him. And Adonai said unto Cain, where is Hevel, your brother? The voice of your brother's blood, they scream unto me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, Arurata min hadama, which split open her mouth to take your brother's bloods from your hand, because you work, serve, tavod the ground. She will not add, giving her strength. Shaken off and thrust out, na vanad, you will be in the land. And Kayan said to Adonai, great is my sin, beyond caring carrying. Here you have driven me, hen gerashta oti, today away from the face of the ground, mipnehadama, and from your face I will be hid, and I will be na vanad in the land. Thank you. It is easy to hear this and just think, well, Adam got cursed and the ground got cursed, and now Cain got cursed and the ground got cursed and not notice the difference in the structure here. But if you see before, it says, Aurora, Aurora ba'avorcha. And here it says, Aurora ta min ha'adama. So in the first place, you are cursed along with the ground, kept in relationship to the ground. And here, Cain is cursed away from the ground, pushed away from the ground. The curse separates him from the ground. <clears throat> so he's lost his relationship with God and his relationship with the earth. And that's what it means to say, great is my sin beyond carrying because you've driven me away from the face of the ground and from your face will be, I will be hid. So Cain is saying, in, in effect, I could carry one of these tragedies, one of these traumas, but not both of them. It's too much. I can't live where I have no relationship with you and no relationship with the earth. <clears throat> now, what he gets in return after this plea, uh, you know, pitiful plea, really, is not that good. He gets a sign on his head so that nobody's going to just kill him when they see him, whatever that means. Uh, this is another place, by the way, Matt, where the pre-Adamite question comes up, because the question is, who are the other people who are going to kill him? So the Midrash understands it to mean that the animals would kill him, because they understood that he had lost the image of God by becoming a murderer. And when by losing the image of God, he lost God's protection in a way. And so God has to give him a substitute, not the divine image, but a mark that shows the animals that even though this person doesn't have the divine image, you still shouldn't eat him. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a very pallid uh, um, fixing of a very tra traumatic and tragic problem that he has. He doesn't really get restored to anything. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, the flood. Who wants to read the beginning of the flood? Do we have a volunteer? I'll read. Okay, thank you. Hashem, my pleasure, thank you. Hashem saw that the human's evil ra'at ha'adam in the land was tremendous. And Hashem drew in Bayinachem, for the one made the Adam within the land, and the one was pained unto God's heart. And Hashem said, I will blot out the Adam I created from off of the face of the land, from human to beast to crawler to bird of the skies, for I am withdrawn against Nihamti, my making them. And the land was ruined before the Elohim, and the land was filled up with violence. And Elohim saw the land and here her ruin, for all flesh ruined his way on the land. And Elohim said to Noah, the end of all flesh comes before me, for the land is filled with violence from before them. Here am I going to ruin them with the land. Good. <coughs> What's the problem here? 
Is the problem that human beings are being violent or evil to each other? Is that what God expresses concern about? Or is it that humans are being evil to God? No, not neither. God is caring about what humanity's actions do to the land. That's all that God is caring about, in fact. And th this point is mentioned seven times. <clears throat> to really make sure you know this is important. So the problem that leads to the flood is what human action is doing to destroy or ruin the land, the earth. God is taking the part of the earth against humanity in this section. And that's where we go. That's where the flood story is going. Except that Noah tempts God to, to not wipe everyone out. Maybe this will work. Maybe if I just save this one family, it's going to work. So, you know, the flood happens. They come out. At the end of the flood, that's what letter I is all about. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yes. You all can see the whole part of I, I think, right? The way it is set up right now. Who feels like reading that part? It does help me to take a break from speaking, by the way, um, post pneumonia. So I thank you and you, you all who are doing that to help me. <coughs> Anyone? Oh, it starts up here. I, Elohim remembered Noah and all the animals. Go ahead, Michael. You're, you're, um, you're muted. Okay, we have to unmute, ask to unmute. There we go. Does that work? Yes. Good, thank you. Elohim remembered Noah and all of the animals, kol hachaya, and beasts which were with him in the ark. And Elohim spoke to Noah saying, go out from the <coughs> Every animal, chaya, which is with you from all flesh, bring out with you, and they will swarm in the land and bear fruit and increase in the land. More? Yeah, go ahead. You can read the whole section. And yud -Heh vav -Heh said unto his heart, I will not add to cursing any more the ground for the sake of humanity, but avor ha'adam, and I will not add any more to striking down all life as I did throughout all the land's days, sowing and reaping and cold and hot and summer and winter and day and night will not stop rest. Lo Yishbotu. Elohim said to them, um, bear fruit and increase and fill the land and a fearing of you and terror of you will be over any an every animal of the land, chayat ha'aretz, into your hand they are given. All that crawls which lives, for you it will be for eating like green plants I have given to you all. Just the flesh with his soul, enough show his blood you will not eat. And you bear fruit and increase, swarm in slash through the land and increase in her. Good. Thank you so much. <clears throat> There's a lot going on here. First of all, you notice that Elohim, remem Hashem, no, Elohim remembers Noah and all the animals. So God's concern is not for Noah over against the animals, but for Noah and all the animals. Kolachaya. And when they go out, Elohim is interested in the chaya, again, every animal which is with you. They will swarm in the land, bear fruit, and increase. Now the next piece, Hashem said unto his heart, or unto God's heart is how I had meant to translate that, I will not add to cursing any more the ground for the sake of humanity. <coughs> I will not add any more to striking down all life as I did. So 
if we take that idea, cursing the ground for the sake of humanity, ba'avor ha'adam, God is saying, up until now, for the sake of humanity, I was willing to curse the ground. And from now on, I declare the relationship over. I give up. Humanity will do what it does. I can do whatever I need to do to humanity, but I'm not going to make the ground. I'm not going to make all life suffer because of what human beings do. I, God, will not take this, the action to strike down all life. I, God, will not add cursing more to the ground for the sake of humanity. Of course, it doesn't say that we won't curse the ground ourselves just by what we do. In fact, that's what we're doing now. <clears throat> At the end, it says, you bear fruit and increase swarm through the land and increase in her. The word swarm is not used for human being except one other place in the whole Torah. Generally, swarm is for things like insects and fish. And it implies humans being a, a, a losing a kind of standing of being special and unique in a way. <clears throat> the other time where it appears is where it says that the Israelites in Egypt bear, um, bear fruit and increase in like, and swarmed. It's not an exact quote, it's an approximate quote. But um, in that case, the swarming of the Israelites is how the Egyptians see them, so that when they see them increasing their population, they become horrified and they look at they start to look at uh, the Israelites as, as you would look at insects. They dehumanize them. So it's a dehumanizing uh, um, verb to use about human beings. So God is really saying, you know, I'm I'm through with you. You just you do what you're going to do. And, you know, hopefully you won't ruin it for everyone else. But we still have a covenant to go. And there's a little more hopefulness in the covenant than there is in the part that we just read. Oh, uh, obviously, a very important thing that I forgot to mention just now. The human-animal relationship is also torn apart here. So they had... Humans and animals lived in some kind of harmony in the Garden of Eden. They, Adam gave them names. According to the Midrash, Adam would call them and they would come to the Adam. This sounds like a kind of dominion, right? A kind of prevailing over. Fearing of you will be over every animal. You will eat them. But it's exactly the opposite of what dominion meant in chapter 2 and 3 of Bereshit. Because in that point, as I was saying, what it meant for humans to have dominion, if we want to read the two chapters, the first two chapters together, is that the human would call the animal and the animal would come to them, not run away from them. But here, it's the opposite. As soon as they see the human, they're going to run away because they're full of fear and terror. Fear and terror is not the relationship that we're supposed to have. It's a relationship that we have after God gives up on humanity, as it's portrayed in the story. <clears throat> okay, we got one more section to read before we get to Shemitah, and I think we're going to finish this on time. So, someone read, someone read the Rainbow Covenant. Brian, do you want to read one? Um, sure, I can do that. Okay. Um, okay, so Rainbow Covenant. Um, Elohim said unto Noah and unto his son, saying, And I, here, I am erecting my covenant with you and your seed after you, and the soul of every animal, every soul living, kol nefesh uh, with you, among every animal of the field, kol chayat hasadah with you. <coughs> um, and all flesh will not be cut off anymore um, from the floodwaters, and there will be no more flood to destroy the land. And Elohim said, this is the covenant sign which I'm placing between me and between you all and between every living animal, every living animal soul, which is with you for generations for all time. Uh, my bow I put into the clouds and she will be a covenant sign between me and the land and I will see her remembering the covenant for all times between Elohim and between all flesh on the land. Yeah, thank you.
<clears throat> There's not every instance is quoted, but the word breed appears seven times in this section. Seven is always a big deal, as you as you all know. At every point where it talks about the covenant, it's never the covenant between God and humanity. It's always a covenant between God and humanity and all the other animals, or between God and the land. So the first covenant is actually not a human-centered covenant. It's very interesting because I think we tend to think of covenant as being just a thing between God and humanity, quite the opposite. This is the base. This is the foundation of what covenant means between God and all living creatures, between God and the land. Again, the emphasis being God saying, I'm going to take the part of the land. It's a covenant sign between me and the land. I'm not going to, again, it's a similar theme, but with a much more optimistic tone as what we saw in the previous section, which is God saying, I'm not going to keep make the what happens to the land dependent on what humanity does anymore. <coughs> now, what happens after the flood? Then we get the Tower of Babel, um, the refusal of humanity to go connect to the land, the refusal of them to spread through the land, which in the Torah is portrayed as something that is a... Uh, experience of compassion that we should come in contact with the land in all its all its places its forms its diversity even though i think when we might think about it in modern times it's more about humanity overrunning the land cutting down all the forests you know destroying all the watersheds etc but that that's not the picture that brashid has it has this picture that if we would only spread through the land in a way that would enable us to be in connection with the land everywhere we went we would transform and the problem with the Tower of Babel, of course, is that it keeps people disconnected from the land. It's all about disconnecting from the land. <clears throat> I have to say, though, there's a way in which God is not being sufficiently empathetic here. Because, of course, after a flood where all life was wiped out, people are going to want to get high, high up from the ground so they don't die again. Right? Not crazy. So uh, there's, it's not just that humans keep screwing it up. God also seems to not really you know, in the char character, as God is a character in a story, not really getting what's going on on the human side also. So <clears throat> that's a separate issue, not directly related to what I want to talk about, but interesting to keep in mind. Okay, now we get to the Shemitah Covenant. I'm going to read this one. Six years you will sow your land and gather your produce. The seventh you will release Tishmetena and forswear, and the poor of your people will eat, and the remainder of the animal of the field, Kayat Hasada, will eat. Six days you will do your work, and in the seventh day you will stop for the sake of your ox and your donkey resting, and your female servant's child, and the stranger resoling, Vayina Fish. <coughs> Here we have this paradigm, which is there is a, a kind of covenantal relationship with the land described as the Shemitah year, described as the cycle of seven, which also is reflected in the seventh day and the Shabbat. And in both cases, um, what it means to have Shabbat is that the animals also have to have Shabbat. And the vulnerable people also have to sh have Shabbat. And most specifically, the animal of the field needs to be able to eat what's left over in the seventh year. And we'll see the same thing appears in Leviticus. So why is this so important? <clears throat> because we've only had two times before this where humans and animals were sharing the same food or in the same kind of league as far as food, right? So one is Gan Eden, uh, or actually the first story uh, of Reishi, chapter one, which we tend to think of as Gan Eden. It doesn't actually say Gan Eden in chapter one, just to note, but, but what we think of as Gan Eden, where it says that you will eat the same thing, you'll eat the plants, every green grass, I give it to you all, right? Every green plant I give to you all. <clears throat> That's the first time. Second time, uh, in the ark, humanity's tasked with gathering the food for all the animals together so that they can survive for a year in the ark. And um, <coughs> pardon me. And that is a kind of um, convivencia, a living together that works for one year. But of course, at the end of it, the, 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 the harmony and the living together is shattered, ripped apart completely. But here we have now this return to this idea that somehow humans and the other animals could live in some kind of harmony at least one year out of seven. 
at least one day out of seven in both cases, right? So now we get to the Shemitah covenant, the full picture of it, the big picture, the Leviticus picture. Hashem spoke to Moshe in Mount Sinai saying, you know, the famous Midrash question, Ma inyan Shemitah et sel Sinai. What does Shemitah have to do with Sinai? Why does it say at the beginning and the end of the section about Shemitah in Leviticus, Har Sinai? Of course, we're here to stand at Har Sinai tonight, right? <clears throat> um, there's lots of different Midrashic answers, but the, the more obvious answer is because the point of Sinai is to create a society capable of observing a Shemitah year. Because that's not a small task. That is a huge, tall order. And not only that, but even a seventh Shemitah year, which is a Yovel, a Jubilee year, where radical land reform will happen every 50 years, completely radical restructuring of society. And every seven years, complete ending of capitalism for that one year, where everyone shares the same food, as we'll see here, okay? So Hashem spoke to Moshe and Mount Sinai, saying, speak to Israel's children, say unto them, you will come to the land which I give you, and the land will rest, or stop, Shavta. So Adonai Shabbat, Shabbat Adonai, right? In the seventh year, a Sabbath, Sabbath, Shabbat Shabbaton, will it be for the land, a Sabbath for Adonai? Don't sow your field, sow your field, and don't prune your vineyard. This is the key line I was referring to before. And the Shabbat of the land will be for you for eating, for you and for your male servant and for your female servant and for your hired worker and for your settler living as a stranger with you and for your beast and for the animal which is in your land. Chaya asher ba'atzecha. All of her produce will be to eat. So uh, chaya, by the way, in, in case anyone was unclear, chaya means wild animal as opposed to domesticated animal, which is what a behemoth is, right? <coughs> so... The rabbis took this verse very seriously to the point where you were, had to take down your fences or leave open your gates the whole Shemitah year so that the wild animals could go in and out of your fields and eat whatever they wanted to. And you couldn't eat something in your house that wasn't growing in the field because you could only eat something that the wild animals could also have a chance of eating. So that, that's the principle of the or. So this is a big, um, this was a big deal. It's not just kind of a, a minor detail. It's an essential detail that tells us that in this year of Shemitah, we're going to return to something that connects us to Gan Eden, that connects us to the way the world was supposed to be. And the kind of world that's going to be created in this, by the way, uh, parenthetically, but maybe not so parenthetically, is you're going to, uh, with this kind of rule, you're going to emphasize fruit trees and permaculture and things that will grow without you having to farm them and still be able to feed you. So it not only just describes resting the land, but also pushes all of agriculture in a particular direction, which is uh, for us now, we understand ecologically quite meaningful to have a, a world that's based on a more permaculture, food forest kind of model, instead of um, uh, an annual seed grain kind of model. <coughs> you will count for yourself seven Sabbaths of years, seven years, seven times, and call out liberty or release Daror in the land to all those inhabiting her. It will be a jubilee, a yovel for you. You will turn each person to their tribe possession. This is the radical land reform that happens every seventh Shemitah. You will do my statutes and settle on the land securely, la vetach, and then land will give her fruit and you will eat to be satisfied and you will settle securely on her. And the land you may not sell permanently, let's be tut, for the land is mine for you are strangers and settlers with me. So in all the land of your tribe possessions, redemption, you will give to the land. So <clears throat> the key here is we understand, what we need to understand is we don't own the land, the land owns us, right? This goes against everything about how the Israel and Palestine negotiate their craziness, by the way, you know, because it's all about controlling the land as opposed to letting us be informed by the land. Now, I think I have, do I, can I take another minute, Brian, before we have to stop? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the last session on the track, so we can do that, but some people might be stepping need to out. Go out to the other one. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll make the main point really quickly. And then uh, is there, should we have smooth space afterwards if people want to, since we don't have another one? Uh, for a few minutes. Okay, that's all good. Um, what happens if we do this covenant, this Shemitah covenant? 
The land, I'm going to not read word by word, by word but go through um, highlights here. The land will give her produce. He will dwell securely in the land. The tree of the field will give his fruit. I will put peace in the land. And I myself will walk in your midst and I will become for you Elohim and you will become for me a people. The implication of this is that if humans aren't in the right relationship with the land, God can't even be God to us. It's, it's, it's that deep a, a level. And what happens if you don't do it? You have a series of curses, right? If you will not listen, you will despise my statutes, undo my covenant. Even so, I'll do this to you, set my face against you. Your land will not, you will you completely use your strength for emptiness and your land will not give her produce. That's the first curse. Second, I will send out the animal of the field against you, right? She will make you childless. The animals will eat you. Chayat Hasada, we're talking about wild animals again. Second, if you will not listen to me with all this, I will walk with you in a fury of opposition. You will eat the flesh of your sons and your daughter's flesh you will eat. That's a pretty bad curse. But parent parenthetically noting, that's what we're doing to the future generations. We're eating them essentially by destroying the land. And you will, I will scatter in the nations. Being scattered in the nations is the next curse. <clears throat> then the land will enjoy her Sabbath. This is how we know that what matters about the covenant most is the Shemitah year, because the whole point of what all these curses is that then the land will finally get to observe her Shabbat. All the days of her desolation, she will rest what she didn't rest when you were dwelling on her. And you will be lost in the nations and the land of your enemies will eat you. That's the ultimate curse, even though it doesn't sound like the worst, because it's the complete reversal of the right relationship between humans and the land. And each of these curses is a degradation and destruction of the way humans should be in relation to the land, in relation to the animals, and in relation to their food. And of course, also in relation to God. However, God promises, this is the third promise. The first promise is I will bring you to the land. The second promise is if you screw it up, you get kicked out. The third promise is, but you'll still get another chance, eventually, if you do tshuva, right? Those of you who are left, their uncircumcised hearts will be bent to shape and I will remember my covenant with your ancestors, right? And I will remember the land and then you will be brought back to try again. But if you mess it up again, you will get kicked out again, right? There's no limit. And what God clearly says here is, if you make me choose between the land and you, I choose the land over you every time. And there's, in a way, what God is saying is, please, I beg you, don't make me choose, choose between you and the land. Choose the land. Choose to take care of the land. Don't choose to own and dominate and control it. Choose to serve it. And then you'll be in that right relationship, and we will be in right relationship. And I, you won't make me choose between you and the earth. So these are the statutes and judgments in Torah, which Hashem set between God and between children, Israel's children on Mount Sinai by Moshe's hand. Again, saying, this is the climax of Sinai. This is the point of Sinai. All right, it's 2.30. We can have a little schmooze okay. time if we want, it seems. So Maybe I just want to you know, thank David so much for the session. Um, thank you all for, for being here with us. Um, if anybody um, does not know where to go next, um, the link to all of the sessions, I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Um, and then you can just click on the name of the session, and then that will open up the Zoom <coughs> link for the track. And there's still about uh, five or so tracks to open um, for the 2.30 slot. Thank you so much, Brian, for facilitating us. Sure. Thank you for all the readers and all of the listeners also. Thank you so much. Anyone want to make comments or questions in our few minutes before we break up? I convinced you all. Marilyn, are you trying to say something? Yep. Yes. Yeah amazing teaching very original and i'm trying to figure out how did we screw things up so badly the way mm -hmm. that you like how did we get so off track you know considering that you know you're making a very good argument that it's been laid out very very clearly <laughs> that we are there to serve the land and yet 
I would say that Judaism is not really presented like that to most people. Yes. I mean, exile does weird things to your brain. Uh-huh. You're saying the first exile, like getting kicked out of Gan Eden, that exile? <laughs> or all well, the Every exiles? single exile has done weird things to our brains and, and uh, kind of tampered uh, with, um, hacked that relationship and kind of uh, messed it up. Right. So, so when we came back to the land in this past century, as a nation, of course, some of us, some Jews were always there. My great grandfather was Palestinian Jew. Um, but coming back as a nation, we did not have the wherewithal to reestablish that right relationship because there was a lot of trauma there. And we're seeing that at this very moment, you know, how our trauma makes it hard for us to live up to the mission that we've been given. So, you know, why did God make a world where there's so much trauma so that it's so hard to get things right and to heal? We could, we could just as much blame God as we, as if we want to. Um, I don't know that we want to do that. We could go either way on that question. Anyone else? Well, if, no, nobody, if no one else has any other comments that I would love you to go back to the curses um, in Gan Eden, where you said that those were, that they weren't exactly curses. You were saying they were just a, a picture of what you're not supposed to do. Could, could you just say a little bit more about that? Oh, well, um, I'll just give you one quick example. Like, um, no one, no one in their right mind says, well, God said women should, should, um, have pain in childbirth. So therefore we're not going to give people, you know, we're, no one's going to get an epidural because God says you should give birth in pain. Right. So it's not like there are descriptions of how we don't want the world to be. And in fact, uh, by naming them as curses, God is saying you should try to overcome them. You should try to reverse them. So one of those curses is gender hierarchy. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, it's been fun to learn with you. Normally, um, when I haven't had pneumonia in the week before, I would end with singing. <laughs> but it's, it's just not the best thing for me to do right now. So I apologize for that. Thanks for great teaching. Thanks. Uh, Y'all, um, neochasset.org, the, the link that I put at the beginning of the chat has these texts that you can go, and there's, there's several versions of them, including one with commentary, if you want to play with it more. Would you put and that link? There's lots of other resources there, too. Would, yeah. you put that, would you put that link in the chat once more? Yes, I'm going to do that. OK. Are you giving another session, too, as it says in the schedule? I was supposed to, but after I got pneumonia, I thought probably I should go to bed at 2.30. Oh, okay. I hope you feel better. You know? I'm sad. I was really looking forward to that session. I'm sorry. I would love to do that with you. Uh, there's so much to say. My book, Kabbalah and Ecology, go, goes into all the stuff that I was going to talk about in that next session. And there's a lot of material on my website about that, too. Thank so, um, and I'll if catch you, you want, tomorrow with Jill and if, I. Like if you those. get on my website's email list and, uh, you know, occasionally I do a seminar on these things as well. Be happy to have any of you come join that. Thanks. Yeah. Hope you feel but my better. apologies for not, not uh, staying up later. No, take care. I hope you feel better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. He's not active. Have, have a have a great rest of the decone if you're sticking with us. Or if not, I hope everybody has a good rest. <laughs>